Um, I'm Melissa Rosenberg. I'm the director of the Autism Society of Maryland. And thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar on back to school butterflies. Um, our presenters this evening will be Beth Benavides and Beth Ann Hancock. They'll be offering practical tips and strategies for a fresh start to the new school year. Parents and guardians will learn how to communicate successfully with their child's team and how to create their own progress monitoring systems. Um, before we begin, I'd like to introduce um, our interpreter. We will be offering simultaneous interpretation for Spanish speakers today. We'll remain together for um, a welcome and instructions. And um, if you are having any trouble hearing us, there is a button down at the bottom. It's either a globe or three dots. You want to hover over that and just click if you're on the three dots to interpretation, you wanna make sure you're either in the English room if you wanna hear English or Spanish if you wanna hear Spanish. You do not wanna be in original audio. So right now I'm going to introduce Magda to please um, explain how, how it will work to access the Spanish language room. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Melissa. Uh, buenas tardes a todos, yo soy Magdalena Castro Luis. Uh, de Servicios de Interpretación y Traducción, ALMA. Uh, bienvenidos al webinar de hoy titulado Nervios por el Regreso a Clase, Consejos para que los padres alivien su ansiedad. Uh, las personas um, que necesitan escuchar la presentación en español uh, pueden ir a la parte de abajo de la pantalla um, y escoger el globo hacer clic ahí eh, y escoger eh, la opción español. Uh, también, uh, si no encuentran el, el globo, hay tres puntos o tres bullets donde también pueden escoger la opción de español. Uh, también quiero recordarles a los participantes mantener sus micrófonos y sus cámaras apagadas para evitar interferencias uh, con las, la grabación o con la presentación. Esta presentación va a ser grabada y se le eh, y estará disponible en la página web de uh, autismo de la Sociedad de Autismo de Maryland. Uh, entonces, uh, ahora sin más demora, le paso el micrófono en español a Alicia Ardila también de, de nuestros servicios de ALMA, a quien va a hacer la interpretación um, de la presentación. Esta es una presentación, una interpretación simultánea. Gracias y nos vemos. Thank you, Magda. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenters this evening, uh, Beth Benavides and Mary Beth Hancock, both work with the Autism Society of Maryland as special education consultants. They support families in Howard and Anne Arundel counties, respectively. I'm going to turn the program over to them and allow, and ask them to introduce themselves a little bit, and then, then we'll get started. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Benavides, and I have been a longtime advocate with the Autism Society here in Howard County um, and part of the Family Advocacy and Parent Education Program. And um, um, my day-to-day -day job, I work at the Huston Institute for Autism. Beth Ann? Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't unmute myself, thank you. Hi, I'm Beth Ann Hancock. Um, I'm an educational advocate, and I also am doing uh, consulting work with the Autism Society of Maryland in Anne Arundel County. So welcome everyone. Tonight, um, our presentation is on back to school butterflies. We know that children feel them and we as parents feel them too. I really uh, recall <laughs> not liking August, the end of August very much um, and being very nervous. So we're going to give you some tips tonight to hopefully ease your anxiety a bit as you head into a new school year. Some ways to get organized some things to think about in terms of communicating with your team. Um, and really just hoping to start the year off on the right foot. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, so my first 
piece of advice is not to panic. There is still a lot of time left. I know it's the end of August uh, and we only have a couple days left before the school year officially begins, um, but there's still time to get organized, right? So there's time to review your child's IEP, to create, create a communication system, create a communication log for yourself, um, to share information about your child, to ask questions if you have them, and really to just plan how you're going to get involved in the year ahead. So first, we always advise parents to organize the paperwork. We know that when we're organized and things are in, the, in one place, it's easier to grab what we need. We might feel a little less stressed. Um, and so we're not fumbling around looking for things. So whether you create a binder or you have a folder or a digital file or even just a file in your email, it's totally up to you to choose a system that works for you. Um, because when you choose a system that works for you, you're going to be more likely to use it. Um, but however it is, there are certain documents that we really feel it's important for parents to have top of mind and, and top of hand so that you can grab them if needed. You can reference them if needed um, throughout the school year. For your binder. The most important thing to put in the front of your binder is communication with school staff. So we're always going to advise parents to keep careful track of any communication with their school, with the school staff, whether that's with the principal, with a case manager, with a general educator or a service provider. Um, and I'll give you some examples of some logs that you can create. Um, but it's really important to keep track of that communication with dates and times and even just quick notes about what was shared. Um, another section of your binder would be any evaluations. So we advise you to know when you consent it to any evaluations, because as you know, when you consent to an evaluation, there's a timeline that kicks in. So it's important to know the date that you consent it so that you can ensure um, that things are progressing on the appropriate uh, timeline. Then the evaluation itself. So that would be perhaps the psychological evaluation, educational assessment, um, a speech language assessment, OT assessment, anything like any assessments that went into that uh, complete evaluation of your child. You'll have a section for the current IEP, and then you'll have what we call prior written notice. So prior written notice is both meet, meeting notes or meeting notices that you get. Um, so those are the documents that you get in advance saying when the IEP meeting is going to be held and who will be participating and what the purpose of the meeting is. And then prior written notice also refers to the meeting minutes that you give after the meeting. I know that seems kind of weird, um, but prior written notice really refers to that parents have prior written notice to any decisions that have been made, any um, agreements that the IEP team is proposing um, so that parents um, have, have time to um, consent to those or, or time to um debate, you know, kind of say that they disagree with them. Um, so everything has to be in writing from your meetings. So again, prior written notice 10 days before an IEP meeting, you must receive prior written notice about the meeting. And then five school days after the meeting, you must receive the meeting minutes um, from, from the meeting, the meeting notes. Okay. And if you don't in those timelines, then you have every right to ask for them. Um, Another section that you might have is report cards, um, progress notes, as well as those grade level assessments, um, the scores that you get for your child, um, those would be in a section. And then if your child has a behavior plan, some of our children have behavior plans, and we might even have behavior notes or data. So if, um, if you're keeping track of how often um, your child is having behaviors at school or how often, you know, you're getting called to come into school because things aren't going well, you're going to want to keep track of that for behavior. And um, that's just as important as those academic goals. And then procedural safeguards um, handbook. So you know that you're offered this at every IEP meeting and um, there is a new procedural safeguards book. So it's not blue. Um, it's not going to be that blue book that they hand you. Um, and it's, um, got a date on it of July 2024. 20, so this year, when they ask you if you if you would like it, please say yes. Um, you know, please make sure that you have a copy of this. Really, anything important about the IEP process, you're going to be able to find in this procedural safeguards notice. So it has your timelines, it has what your rights are, it has what protections are in place around your child's IEP. 
Um, I mentioned a communication log, and again, it's truly up to you how um, what what this looks like. It can be a sheet of paper with nothing else on it, but dates and and who you communicate it with, um, and what was discussed, or it can actually be a log. Beth Ann and I refer quite often to understood.org in our presentations because it's a wonderful parent website, parent-friendly website on special education. Um, and they have so many wonderful download, free downloadable documents um, that, you know, really do help parents stay organized. And this is just one example. This is a communication log that they make available. And um, really, I think it, it's it's a great way just to kind of keep track of who you're talking with and, and how often and what's being discussed and decided. Oops, sorry. Always, always, always follow up your phone calls with an email. Uh, so as we say, if something is not in writing, it didn't happen, it wasn't discussed, it becomes a he said, she said type of situation. Um, so, you know, if you are having an informal conversation with a teacher at the curb when you're picking up your child or there's a phone call, always follow up in writing. So I've just given you some examples here where you might say something like, you know, geez, thanks so much for the conversation this afternoon and your offer to revise the daily communication sheet. I'll look forward to receiving that new sheet by Friday, as you mentioned. I really appreciate your help. So right there, you've documented that the teacher offered to revise the daily communication sheet and that you're expecting to receive it by Friday of this week. And you would know, you know, you would note the date. Um, that way, if you don't receive it, you have that in mind, you can kind of cure again to say, oh, remember that daily communication sheet. Um, can, can we get the revised sheet? Um, or if they're calling to tell you about an incident in PE or an incident during the day, lots of times this kind of um, good behavior data, right? So um, you might say something like, you know, thanks for calling me today about the incident in PE. I just wanted to make sure I had the details correct. So Charlie came to PE and seemed upset and he was screaming um, and saying he needed a drink of water. And Ms. Clark, the parent, said he would have to wait till lunch. And this triggered him to have a meltdown and not be able to participate at all. Is that correct? So right there, you're documenting where it happened, when it happened, what the trigger was, who responded, and what the response was. And this is the type of thing that over time, you know, you might look in the behavior plan and say that wasn't at all what was supposed to happen. Um, or this, you know, I want to talk with the team about what we can do differently around PE um, and if he needs a water break. That again, these are all details, important details for our kids that sometimes really can make a difference. Um, so we just want to have them document it. Okay. All right. So reviewing your child's current IEP. So the cornerstone of your child's educational program is the IEP, right? This is individualized. Um, it's a, just as important for you as a parent to know what's in that IEP as it is for the teachers. Uh, so quite often we'll say, we don't the teacher read the IEP, but have we as parents really read it? Have we reviewed it before school started? Do we know what's in there? Um, are we sure it's as up to date as it needs to be? Um, as you know, this IEP is what guarantees the services and supplementary aids, the accommodations, all of those modifications that your child's going to receive. So, you know, this contract is really so critical um, and we want to make sure that you too are taking a look at it. So we want you to know the important dates, the present levels in the IEP, um, and the current needs. Do the goals fit? Do they fit for this year? Um, and are the accommodations up to date? Is there anything perhaps over the summer that you learned in ESY would be helpful to add? So parents always know what the important dates are for your child's IEP, and you'll find them on the first page, that front page of your child's IEP and the bottom right corner I think most of them look the same, but on that first page, you're gonna see a section that has all of these important dates. So you'll have the child's annual review date, uh, and then you will have a little further down, you'll see the projected annual review date. So as you see, it's one year apart, right? So when you reviewed the IEP the last time, they have one year, you meet every year to write a new IEP to review it. Um, so this date should go on your calendar. So if you have a date coming up in October, or whatever it is throughout the school year when your annual review is going to be, make sure you have that on your calendar. And so you're getting prepared for it. You're looking out for the notices about it. And normally teams will send you that notice about a month in advance um, because, you know, there's there's lots of things that go into to writing a new IEP. 
Also critically important is the recent evaluation date. So as you know, um, children can be reevaluated or a reevaluation re should be discussed every three years. It's called a triennial evaluation. Um, and uh, that is when the team comes together and they look at the most recent evaluation data and they decide whether they need new data um, or there are new diagnostic questions. Uh, you as a parent have a right to ask for a reevaluation every three years or sooner if you feel one is needed. So even if the team says, we don't have any new diagnostic questions, you can still request uh, the triennial review, uh, evaluation. Um, and that projected evaluation date. So again, know when that is. If it's coming up, um, we need to meet well in advance. Uh, parents have to give consent for uh, an evaluation and that timeline starts ticking. Um, so usually figure on about three months from start to finish um, on when you sign the consent, when the evaluation takes place, when the reports are written, when you meet to discuss the reports, and then when you revise the IEP. So it is quite a process, uh, and, but it's important. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you, you know that you may have around that process. The next section you're going to want to really take a look at are the present levels. Um, when the IEP is drafted and then whenever it's discussed at a meeting, information in this section is going to get updated by the team. So you'll want to take a few minutes to look at this section and look at the progress notes from the last school year and last quarter. So over the summer as well, see how your child's doing on those goals and objectives, see what kind of progress there was being made um, and start there in, time, in terms of where you're tracking for this school year. OK, so that's kind of your baseline as your child starts school is where they, you know, kind of where they were at the end of quarter four, what the most present levels were, or current levels are, what the present levels say. Um, you want to know what that baseline is for your child as you start the school year. Um, accommodations. This is section three of the IEP. Again, this is where you're going to find all of your instructional supports, the program modifications any social or behavioral supports or physical environmental supports. You know, perhaps there's something that um, you know worked really well over the summer in ESY, a new teacher tried something new uh, and, and it was really, really helpful. And so you wanna talk to the IEP team about adding that as an accommodation for your child or, or perhaps a environmental support. Um, that's what That would go in the accommodation section. So definitely take a look at this. Make sure everything is in place. Make sure that um, you know the agreed, agreed upon accommodations are in place because if they are not, then your students not, and they're not, if they're not being provided, if the accommodations are listed and they're not being provided, then your child's not receiving FAPE. So it's important to know what they are. If your child is supposed to have homeschool communication, and you're not receiving it, then they're not receiving an accommodation. They're not receiving a supplement, a supplementary, right? A support. Um, so that their IEP is not being fully implemented. If your child is supposed to have their work broken down for them or chunked and it's not being done, then they're not receiving a free appropriate public education. They're not receiving FAPE. Okay. So again, appropriate is determined. Um, it's individualized, appropriate is what is appropriate for your child as determined by their IEP, okay, their needs. And it's important for parents to know the difference between supplementary aids and accommodations and program modifications. Uh, so that we have lots of different types of, of accommodations. These are just a very few example um, here, you know, you might have extended time, your child might be able to use a calculator or a timer, um, they might have, um, you know, tasks, task lists or visual, visual uh, schedules, all those kinds of things. Program modifications, on the other, other hand, is really something different, right? So it's something different than their same age same grade level peers have. So it could be an alternative text. It could be um, a revised assignment, uh, perhaps fewer problems on assign an assignment. All those are considered modifications, okay? And for parents that would like to know what kind of assessments and, or I'm sorry, what kind of accommodations are out there, the Maryland State Department of Education has just published um, a new book in, in August or this month um, on 
assessments, accessibility, and accommodations. Um, so you might want to take a look at that um, and you know familiarize yourself with what accommodations are as opposed to modifications. Okay. All right. Uh, Beth Ann, is this where you jump in? No, I'm the next one. This is your last slide. Oh, oh, okay. So does the IEP fit your child's current needs? So um, as we've discussed, the IEP identifies special education and related service support. So related services are OT, speech and language, um, uh, physical therapy, if you have adaptive PE. It also related service also includes AT, so assistive technology. And it includes um, such things as um, nursing, counseling, and transportation is considered a related service too. So if your child requires specialized transportation, that's also considered a related service. Um, so if you believe the current IP needs revision, then you need to request an IEP meeting, okay? Um, and I generally suggest that if you have any concerns, especially if you are transitioning to a new school or a new program, um, a really big change that you go ahead and schedule an interim IEP meeting. So don't wait for that annual, um, you know, let the team know that this is a big year. You really want to do a check-in with the whole IEP team and you'd like to have an IEP meeting um, scheduled within the first 45 days of school. Um, so especially if, you know, if you, if you have, have concerns, um, you will have an annual IEP meeting, as you know, but you are able to call an IEP meeting. It's within your right to call an IEP meeting anytime that you feel you need one. Okay. So just keep that in mind. If you need five of them, then that's what you need. Um, so if you, if you need to meet with the entire team, then go ahead and, and request that meeting. Okay. I'm up. I'm going to talk about the communication with teachers now. Um, so this is where we really get nervous uh, for the first day of school where we're meeting new teachers um, and they're new to your student and you might have a lot of anxiety about how is my student gonna interact with the teacher? How do I communicate to the teacher what my student specifically needs other than what's just in the IEP? Um, and so we're gonna talk about what you can communicate, how to communicate, uh, when and who you're gonna talk to, okay? Um, so what to communicate. So at the very beginning of school, it is advised that you introduce your child to your teacher, to, to their teacher or teachers. Um, if, if you have their contact information, email is usually a great way to do that. And as far as the, um, the method that you use, you can use a variety of methods. You can do anything from a simple email all the way to, you know, something more fancy that resembles more like a modern resume of an adult where you have the child's picture and, and nice layouts and all of that. So you do want to narrow down your list. You don't want to overwhelm the teacher because the more things that you say, the, the less that can be absorbed. So you want to narrow down your list um, and especially focus on the things that are going to be the most important for them to know those first few days um, and, and why they're important to know. Uh, you can share information about your child's disability. Um, you may even want to ask the teacher, you know, what their experience is with other students who have the, you know, similar disabilities as your child, and if there's any information that you can provide to them. Um, I'm sure you have access to all kinds of information about your child um, and and what their needs are, and you can share that with teachers if if they would like that. Um, and also the accommodations specific to your child um why those ones are 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 very um essential um you definitely want to make sure that any general educators especially understand accommodations special educators are familiar with a lot of accommodations but there may be some general educators who haven't specifically worked with a student like yours yet that needed a specific accommodation and it may need to be explained to them if they have any questions um and then anything that may be going on at home um, or in your child's life that they bring with them to school, um, you may want to share that with the teacher or, you know, even if it's, um, if you know that if your child doesn't eat breakfast in the morning, for whatever reason, that it has kind of signaled that they might have a difficult day going forward. So you may want to, you know, establish communication with the teacher um, for anything that's a known 
kind of like flag that, you know, this might be a more difficult day or if something happened overnight. So as far as, you know, how you can communicate these things at the beginning of the year to the teacher, like I said, you can do something really fancy, um, like, like this gray one here, or um, you can go to understood.org. They have several different um, forms and I'm gonna share those with you too. Um, but the, the main things that you definitely want to communicate about your child are their strengths and their interests and what motivates them and then what they need help with and the things that you know work with your child. So these are some other examples of um, some sheets that you can download from understood.org. If these, you know, whichever ones seem like that's what you want to communicate to the teacher. I would choose that. I would not do all of them and then send all of them. You know, you just definitely want to um, be mindful about how much information that you're not overloading, but that you are really being able to highlight the key information. Okay, here's some more examples. It's a great website. And there is a, a link to the website at the end of the uh, presentation as well. So. Like I said, they have these different examples. And then you also want to be able, as much as your child is able, um, to help you develop these uh, develop these uh, informational sheets for the teacher so that the, the child knows what the teacher is going to know about them. And and if the teacher mentions something to them, the child knows, OK, you know, they they read the paper that I brought, you know, or that I gave them that I made with mom and dad. Uh, so these are some quotes from some actual teachers um, for things that they would like that, that they have said that they would that they like to know from families. Um, so sharing little things that you do for your child at home, like if they need help with toileting or opening food items. Um, and if there's any sign approximations, that would be helpful for staff to understand if your children um, communicate through gestures and total communication. Um, sharing prompts that are helpful you know, again, the gestural or verbal, visual, um, and social stories and strategies that are helpful. The teachers teachers want to know, what, how can I help your student be their best? So anything that you have, um, any information that you can have that would help them. Um, so how to communicate. Um, generally, um, teachers use email. Um, and, you know, phone for sensitive conversations. Uh, again, just another uh, reminder after any phone call or discussion where you have um, important points that you want to document or any verbal agreements that are made, you definitely want to follow those up with an email. Um, and an IEP meeting is a great way to talk to the entire team that is servicing your student. Um, and then um, each district has their own like parent portals that sometimes the teachers uh, prefer to use. So there's uh, parent view is like a schoolology or uh, synergy. Um, there's class dojo, power school. Uh, there's different different districts use different ones. Sometimes there is a communication platform in there. Um, and so it's always good to ask the teacher how they prefer to be contacted. Some teachers have given families um, their actual, like they have a, a Google number and say, you may text me, you know, if, if text is easiest for the teacher. Um, I, so definitely ask the teacher what's easiest for them. If there's some kind of method that you aren't able to do or that, that you don't check, let them know also what works best for you so that you guys can know how, that you, how you will be looking for communications from each other. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, and you definitely want to reach out to your students, teachers before they meet them, if possible. So you should be able to have um, their contact information um, to be able to introduce them and communicate all of that important information ahead of time, especially because teachers don't have the overwhelm of the students all in their class at once. Um, you know, they can really take the time to learn your student from the information that you send ahead of time so that they can be prepared. Um, and then, you know, the first week of school is going to be, it's it's going to be bumpy for everybody. Um, so you definitely want 
to respect their time, but you know, don't don't hold anything back that is really, really going to be essential for them to know. And if you need to schedule your emails, if if you normally like think of something at like, you know, 1130 at night and you want to send something to the teacher, you can always schedule your emails to, you know, send in the morning so that the teacher's not receiving emails late at night. Um, even if you don't expect them to reply, um, it's it's really good to to schedule your emails so that they're getting them during their working hours. So we're respecting their space as much as possible. Um, so you want to first start directly communicating with your child's teacher. Your child's teacher is the one who sees your child for most of the day. Um, if you start putting group emails in initially, you know, sometimes, you know, how would you feel if somebody emailed you and then copied your boss on everything that you wrote? You know, you don't want to start out making people hesitant to to talk to you. Um, so you want to start with direct communication um, with the general educators also and, and the special educator um, and the case managers. So some most districts have a case manager for each of their students with IEPs. Sometimes they don't. Um, it really depends on what program that your child's in and what school district you're in. Um, but the case manager should always be in the loop. Um, and then any related service providers may that may need something, may need to know something, um, you can also reach out to them specifically. Okay, um, so we wanna start the year with an open mind, with grace, you know, even though you may have had some troubles the previous year, we're gonna start out new clean slate, new year um and we're going to um give them a chance to try and you know when we're when we're when our teachers are learning our students um sometimes they're going to try things that don't work but we're not going to hold that against them again we're going to give grace um and just support them and you know remind them of things that that you do find helpful um and just come up with a plan when you need new strategies you know you don't have to necessarily have an IEP meeting to talk about new strategies with the teacher. Um, sometimes you can troubleshoot with the teacher um, coming up with new strategies together and then meeting as an IEP team after they've tried it. If they find that it's really helpful, that's when you would meet as a team to add that to the IEP. And you wanna be positive. I mean, your, your child picks up on your attitude. If they see that you're anxious and scared about them getting on the bus and going to school, um, they're going to carry that with them. So you want to make sure that you keep uh, a positive attitude so that your child knows that, you know, this is, you know, everything's going to be great. Um, mom feels good and I'm going to feel good. I can't wait to meet my teacher. You want to keep your expectations high for your students, even though they have disabilities. They, you know, we, we want to make sure that, you know, we're not lowering our expectations just because they have disabilities we're actually you know we're going to keep them high and, and our kids are going to strive for what um, we know that we that they can do um, and then if you can get involved with your child's school that's always recommended um, either in you know school activities or volunteering and chaperoning field trips or events um, and then in the school community as a whole um, and also in the disability community um, as well. Again, more grace, time to adjust, um, you know, be available to the teacher. If the teacher doesn't write back right away, that might be understandable. If you are able to respond right away when the teacher does send you something though, that is really helpful. Um, just always be available if you can. Um, and, and always, you know, Focus on what is working, you know, remind, you know, remind teachers of, you know, it, you know, there, there's going to be things that work one day and then don't work another day. But when things do work, we definitely want to focus on that. Um, also, you know, in IEP meetings, I'm, I'm known to, you know, call out a teacher who's doing something really good, like, you know, like making sure that I, acknowledge that um, 
that, that I acknowledge all the positive things that are going on because in, in the meetings, you, it could get really negative and everybody's focusing on what the problems are. But when we focus on what's working, um, it's motivating to teachers, just like positive behavior uh, supports are motivating to our kids. Um, and just acknowledge that, you know, especially these days, it is really challenging to be in a school, like to teach. It's 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 a extremely difficult job. Teachers are taking on way more than just the teaching. Um, and so just acknowledging that, you know, they're they're giving a lot of themselves so that your child can be successful. OK, so we want to make sure that we don't over communicate um, if if we communicate too much and everything is important, then nothing is important. We get, you know, we want to prioritize our concerns. Um, we don't want to address something small as if it's really big, because then when something really big comes along, it, you know, gets just kind of in the shuffle um, and, and consolidate your concerns. So, you know, if you have a lot of concerns um, and you kind of keep a list with you, so that when you do go down to write your email, you're not like writing multiple emails, you have everything in one email. Okay, and I think Beth, this is back to you. Thank you, and I apologize for the typo on the previous slide, if then. So if everything is important, then nothing's important, I can't. I just second that so much, Beth Ann. I cannot say enough that if you are going to be writing every issue to the teacher, they will tune you out really quickly. Um, if the principal is copied on a message every single day and you're considering how many students, hundreds and hundreds of students are in, or even a thousand of students in, in a high school um, are in a building, that uh, principal is going to tune you out really quickly too. So um, communicate what you must and really consolidate, um, try not to communicate, you know, an email, shoot off an email with, with something, you know, that you're complaining about every day. It just, um, yeah, doesn't usually bode well for parents. So a couple of resources that we just want to put out there, the Autism Society of America has a website. They partnered with um, Nickelodeon and they came up with a bunch of back to school resources. And then of, of course, understood.org um, is what we just highly recommend. They have a whole back to school support guide, a whole section that is just nothing but great articles and downloadable um, forms and documents. Locally, here we are at the Autism Society of Maryland. We have offices in Anne Arundel County, Howard and Montgomery County. Um, so there are advocates, special education advocates. I, I generally take Howard County. Beth Ann generally takes Anne Arundel County. And then X Mines generally takes Montgomery County. Um, so everybody kind of gets built, you know, comes through the Autism Society of Maryland. If you have special education issues, you're going to want to reach out there first. And then they'll let you know um, which of us can help you out. Parents Place of Maryland also offers free advocacy support around IEPs, so you can contact them, and they have parent advocates as well that will look at your child's IEP and give you some feedback. Um, if there's something that you're really concerned about, your child's rights being violated, if there are incidences of abuse of any kind or neglect, um, if, you know, your child was hurt on the school bus or um, just something really um, you feel that your rights have, have been significantly, um, you know, uh, discriminated against, then you might want to consider Disability Rights Maryland. They have an intake line. They'll talk to you. They'll let you know whether it's a case that they'll take, or they may assign you to a pro bono attorney, or they may punch you back to one of us. But um, if you feel you need to, Disability Rights Maryland is available. And then, of course, the Maryland State Department of Education. The website has lots of great parent resources. Many things are being updated now. Um, so always look for updated versions of these documents. I mean, I've just shared two here tonight, uh, the, the procedural safeguards and the accommodations manual, both very important um, and both just updated. And rightslaw.com is another great, a great um, website. It can be overwhelming because you have a lot of attorneys that are 
uh, commenting and providing feedback, which is great, but sometimes it gets so in the weeds that it's hard for parents to really understand or they're taking things out of context. So be careful when you're on rights law. It's a great website for information, but you don't necessarily want to be quoting it unless you're certain that you know what's being said. And then also just wanted to mention that the Family Support and Resource Centers, every county, every local education agency uh, here in, in Maryland has a Family Support and Resource Center. We call them different things in different counties. So like in Anne Arundel County, it's called the Partners for Success Office. In Howard County, it's called the Family Support and Resource Center. But these centers are um, generally... Um, um, managed by parents um, of children that have disabilities. So they've, they've been on the journey um, and they can connect you to support and they can, can connect you to resources. Every county also has a special education citizens, citizens advisory committee, a CCAC. Again, this is kind of like a PTA, how your school has a PTA. So it has a parent teacher association within the school, but the CCAC is really for special education parents. So it's really for special education families that have students receiving special education services. And CCAC um, presents to the Board of Education, so it brings forward um, you know, issues around special education. So it's really important to be involved, to get their emails, to stay up to date on their, their meetings. They have lots of good guest speakers. Um, so that is CCAC. And that's our presentation. Um, so um, Bethany and, and I are happy to take questions. Um, I know that a couple were sent in advance and we have a couple here in, um, in the chat. Um, it looks like, I'll just read the ones in the chat real quick. And then if we don't have any others from those present, then we can go to those that were sent in advance. Um, so one parent, um, so understood.org again is the, the website. And then one parent asked about communication with middle school teachers, and I think Beth Ann did cover that. We do advise that parents connect individually with the general education teachers. So in middle school and high school, you're going to have a lot of teachers, um, but there might be something really specific to music or something really specific to one of the related arts or, you know, math, whatever it is. I think individual, um, you know, contact with these general educators is always a good idea. Uh, because again, there's going to be th things in the general education environment that are different than, you know, if your child's in, in special education, um, kind of pull out for, for some of the, the instruction. Um, those general educators may not read your child's IEP as thoroughly as they should. So if there are really important things that you want to pull out, um, then, then that's a great way to do it. Um, that one of those sheets again, um, about, you know, strengths, challenges, strategies, really good for all the general educators to have kind of like a tip sheet um, for your child. So I would um, definitely um, communicate individually with, with your middle, middle school teachers. Um, and then let's see. Um, Okay, I think that's it for the questions in the chat. Beth Ann, did you want to, are there any, if there are any other questions, please feel free to, to write them in the chat. In the meantime, we're going to take a couple that we received ahead of time. Yeah, um, so I'm going to start by addressing one question. Um, are there any books or trainings for parents handling stress and anxiety? Um, which is a, is a large topic, but as far as focusing this on um, the IEP process um, and working with your student with disability. Um, the first thing I wanna recommend to everybody um, is, so one of the resources was rightslog.org or .com, um, but they they also have publications. And so there is a book, um, some of you may be familiar, but it's called From Emotions to Advocacy. This is a great book to help you understand the process, the IEP process, you know, in a really objective way so that when you do go in, even though you are going, th there's no way to avoid emotions when you're talking about your own kid. There just isn't. Um, but arming yourself with the knowledge and, you know, there's comfort in this book about, you know, just looking at things objectively. Um, that is a, an amazing resource to start with um, to help ease your anxiety. Also, the Autism Society of Maryland hosts virtual support groups 
The next uh, support group is on September 5th, and you can find the information um, on the website and you can register. And that is, uh, you know, just the support of other parents that are walking the same journey as you can really help with your own stress, um, feeling not alone. Um, another question was uh, about dealing with bullies and advocating um, for the child with the schools. So um, if your child experiences bullying, there is a bullying and uh, harassment and intimidation reporting form that should be available on your district's website. Uh, it's also available on the Maryland State Department of Education website. You complete it and you make sure that you turn it into the principal and then it should trigger an investigation. Uh, another tip in, in conjunction with filling out um, and documenting bullying incidents is to also request an emergency IEP meeting so that you can discuss with the team any kind of safety planning that may need to be established um, while, you know, the investigation is going on, especially if it's creating um, a lot of, you know, emotional issues um, or there was like a physical, uh, like a, a physical injury uh, as a result. So definitely like asking that the IEP team assemble to discuss it and document, you know, who the child can go to, like what, you know, what supports are going to be in place, you know, for addressing that. Um, let's see. Uh, Somebody um, um, had asked they're entering the school system for the first time. And so they're very anxious. Um, they wanted they don't understand why they can't meet the teachers or tour the school beforehand. Um, generally, for every school district, uh, there is an orientation for uh, students who are coming into the entering grade um, or students who are new to the school. So you definitely want to reach out to the school to ask about that new student orientation. Um, what I do with a lot of um, in IEP meetings where there is definitely, you know, year after year, you have a child who doesn't adjust really well at the beginning. Um, at the end of the school year, meeting as an IEP team to discuss how are we going to prepare going into next year. You know, um, a lot of times you can get the team to agree that your child does need this and it is an individualized program. So you can have it documented that, you know, your student will, you know, meet the teacher, you know, the day before orientation or, you know, on a day that the school building isn't busy um, so that they can get oriented to the to the classroom, to the building um, and the teacher. Um, you can, you know, request social stories. Um, a lot of teachers, especially with kids who have autism, um, a lot of teachers pre-make social stories for their classroom and they, they may have them available for you to share with your student, you know, if, when you contact that teacher before you start school. Um, and, and so those can be really helpful, too, for the student to have pictures of what the classroom looks like and what their teacher looks like and the things that they're going to be doing. Um, did you want to take the rest of the questions? There? I'm going to jump in with one that was, or two that were posted in the chat. So one um, was about supplementary aids. And I'm just going to back up here um, in my, um, so the question was whether a task list or a calculator or anything like that actually needs to be listed um, in order for your child to have that as an accommodation. And there are certain things that teachers will give students and may not be listed as an accommodation, but if your child needs it, so if your child has to have that calculator uh, for um, an assessment, for instruction, then it has to be listed. So it's kind of like if it's not listed here, then it doesn't have to be provided. Many teachers will still do it, and that's all well and good. Um, but if you were to move next year to another state or if you were to move to another county, you're going to want that calculator to be available to your child if that's what they truly need or a task list. Um, so, you know, generally in this section, our kids have quite a few accommodations as they should, because quite often our kids need that support around them. So when I think of accommodations and supplementary aids, I'm really thinking of a scaffold. So what do we need to put under them to make them most successful, right? What are all of these supports that they need? Um, and they do need to be listed here. Okay, because that guarantees that says 
that the school system has agreed they need them and that they will provide them. Okay, so it's not a, we will if we can. It's no, you've agreed that my child needs that task list in order to access their in education, in order to be behaviorally you know, um, successful, in order to pay attention. Um, and so it must be listed in that section. And so that's why I really do tell parents, you know, take a close look at that and make sure those accommodations are there. You don't want to list accommodations that you don't know your child needs, right? So it's like, yeah, I think they might benefit from having a timer. No, you're going to want to make, you're going to want to pay attention to, they benefit from knowing when things begin and when things end, you know, I know that they need a timer, right? So you're going to want to have some data, some experience to support the accommodations that you're asking for. We don't want to overload them with everything. Again, we want to pick and choose what's most important to them. And it's okay if there's three pages of it, if that's truly everything that they need. Um, the other really important thing that I want parents to take a look at in this section um, around support, um, under there's a section on training. If you need training, on anything. So if you need if you need parent training on um, on how to use your child's communication device, if you need parent training on how to use a visual schedule, that can be included in here. Okay, so you're going to want to have that listed as well. That parent training is required for the use of the child's communication device because if you're not trained on it, then you're not going to be using that communication device at home with your child, right? So you need that training as well. Um, if there's a behavior system that the school is using and you want training on it, that should be listed um, in, in the IEP as well. And that way the school will provide you and anyone working with your child with that training. Again, whatever is specified in the section. If you have questions about this section and you want us to go through it with you, then you know that's definitely something that you can set up an, an appointment um, with us or a parent's place in Maryland. You know, Again, we're happy to talk with parents and, and help you understand that, that IEP. Um, and then another question that was asked was, um, uh, oh, oh, when when do you call it? What are some examples of when you call an emergency IEP? So as I mentioned, you know, you have a right to an IEP meeting whenever you feel that it's necessary. So if you're really concerned that your child is not making progress and and you want to speak to the entire team, it's not just a me matter of meeting with with your teacher, but with the entire team, then you can make that request for an IEP team meeting. Um, an emergency meeting might be held if, for, for instance, um, your child is hurt, if your child is sent home for a big behavioral incident, um, and you really need to kind of pull that team together to say, hey, you know, what happened? What do we need to do differently? Um, if your child's experiencing some extraordinary stress, if there's school refusal, I mean, all those things would be a reason to, to get that team together quickly. Um, to really, we can't wait to address this. Um, those are some examples. Um, but, you know, follow your gut. If your gut is telling you that you need to meet with the entire IEP team, you have a, have a you know, purpose for that meeting, um, then, you know, go ahead and request it. Beth, we have one more question in the chat. I don't know if you can see. Uh, let's see. Yep. In Spanish, um, how can you get help with the IEP in Spanish? Well, um, so the with the IEP process in Spanish, so like how can you get advocacy in Spanish? Uh, if that's the question, I know that Parents Place has, has a Spanish um, speaking ad advocate. Um, we do as well with the Autism Society. Um, Spanish speaking parents can um, contact us and we can set up a, a Zoom with an interpreter to um, to go through the IEP with you. Unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish, but I'm always happy to participate in meetings with an interpreter. Magda, I'm going to put um, Catalina's contact information in the chat if you want to share with the, the mom. Um, and you can have your, just so parents know, you, you know, absolutely you have a right to to documents in your in your language, okay. um, whatever that language may be, um, and you have a right to an interpreter at the meetings. Um, so, you know, make sure that you request that. Also, parents, I want you to know you do have the right to record your IEP meetings. Okay, so it's important that you know that you have a right to record IEP meetings, but you must 
disclose that you are recording. Okay. So it is against the law to record anyone without telling them that you are recording. And that goes for IEP meetings too. So we do advise parents to record their meetings um, because, you know, afterwards you might have questions about what was said, or you, you might not want to be taking notes the whole time. You want to go home and kind of read, listen to, to everything that was discussed. And that's fine. But if you record the meeting, then the school system has to record the meeting. So that's what will happen in the school system. Each school system has a different policy around recording. Um, and so know what the policy in your county is. In Howard County, for instance, you have to give the school 24 hours notice that you're going to be recording. And that's so that they can be sure to have recording a recording device available as well. Um, and you can record you know, on your phone, you can record on your computer, whatever it is. But you cannot record if you've not specifically said that you're going to, going to be recording um, and if you've gotten the consent of the school system. Okay, you have to have consent of the other party. Um, it's against the law to record people. And I would add, um, so a lot of districts, it's a two day policy, but definitely like check, check your district's um, information. And then also part of the recording is that if somebody at the AAP table is uncomfortable with the recording and you want to record, um, that person may be excused if they write down, you know, what they were going to share. So you may have somebody say, I don't want to be on a recording and they have a right to not be on the recording. And you can either then choose not to record or excuse them, but they will give their input in writing. Um, so just know that that's also something that happens. Okay, so we're right up on the seven o'clock hour. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope this information has been helpful. We welcome your feedback. If there's anything that we didn't cover that you have questions about, feel free to reach out to um, the Autism Society at info at autismsocietymd.org and then they'll get you through to us um, if, um, if we need to schedule an appointment. Thank you, Beth Ann and Beth great presentation and um again this this will be posted the recording and the slides will be posted in in a few days on our website thank you all very much and um please look for a short um, um survey to follow just to get your feedback thank you very much have a good evening <laughs>